episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with uh, another fascinating guest helping to create uh, a better tomorrow for so many people. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Brent Wakefield, who is the president and chief executive officer of Meals on Wheels, located in San Diego County, which is the only agency uh, covering the entire county, providing meals to homebound seniors seven days a week. 365 days a year. The organization uh, was established back in the early 1960s, uh, inspired by a few local women who saw the need in their community uh, and decided to start delivering meals to elderly neighbors. Uh, and then ultimately over time, Meals on Wheels has added a variety of technology platforms, uh, not just to deliver the meals, but to track and monitor uh, the total health, safety, and well-being of the program participants throughout the region. Uh, in the last year alone, nearly 500,000 meals were delivered to seniors who are not able to leave their homes uh, by over 3,000 volunteers who not only delivered the nutritious meals, but also provided various safety checks, health checks for these local homebound seniors, and Meals on Wheels played plays an extremely vital role uh, in allowing the senior population to, as we said, uh, talked in the past, age in place, uh, enjoying the, the comforts of living in their own homes. Uh, Brent is a native uh, of San Diego, spent more than two decades working for nonprofits, uh, most recently before uh, Meals on Wheels at the Salk Institute, leading their various fundraising efforts, uh, especially for a project known as Harnessing Plants Initiative, using uh, plants to lower greenhouse gases. Uh, prior to that, he worked in fundraising as the Chief Development Officer at Serving Seniors, also as the Director of Development and External Relations at UC San Diego School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. Uh, Brent has a degree in cultural anthropology from UC San Diego. He studied both in Spain uh, and at the uh, in Italy, University of Bologna, where interestingly he studied development anthropology and semiotics with uh, semiotician and novelist Umberto Eco, and we'll get into that in a little bit, and began his career uh, in Italy where he worked for a dozen or so years in the publishing industry. Uh, Brent Wakefield, welcome to our show today. Thanks for having me, Ira. It's great to be here. Happy Friday. Same to you. Same to you. Um, you know, Brent, I, I'd love to start things off uh, just by handing you the floor for a little bit to uh, talk a little bit more about you, uh, your background, everything from where you grew up, uh, how you uh, developed the, the passion for this particular area in terms of the aging population and, and the whole, this whole theme of aging with dignity. And if you could also talk about those two people in the picture behind you, because I know they were very inspirational uh, in sort of everything that you've, you've been doing for the last few decades. That's right. Thanks so much. Yeah, I am a native San Diegan and on my mom's side of the family, uh, I'm a third generation. So these are my dad's parents and uh, that's Noemi Salazar and Raymond Wakefield. And so if you can believe it, she's from northern Mexico and he's from the Ozarks. So talk about two, uh, a, a clash of cultures, right? So that probably uh, was the foundation for my interest in cultural anthropology too. But um, these people raised me and, and I think um, you know, I, I think I've got to experience um, a different reality than a lot of people of what seniors' lives can be. These people were the center of a large family. Um, kind of everything revolved around them. They were extremely active and connected. And I think because of that connectivity, they both lived well into their 90s. Um, and, and so, you know, I understand the importance of connectivity, but I, I think probably my biggest lesson for my grandparents is, is generosity. I mean, you can imagine this couple uh, at around 70 years old, they're ready to, you know, where they're retired, start traveling the country, visiting all their friends and having fun. And they decided to uh, raise, you know, take on the responsibility of raising uh, me and my sister both. Um, and so giving us uh, an incredible life. And, and so that generosity, I think, is something that is kind of the foundation for you know, what I've done in, in my career in, in the nonprofit world is, is understanding that spirit of generosity and, and these folks really inspire that. So, and, you know, I saw these really active, vital uh, 
seniors in the community, right? And so that connectivity and thinking of people that aren't like that and actually are alone, it's, you know, it, it can be somewhat heartbreaking, but also just, you know, kind of makes me want to be active and, and, and find solutions. So, but, but in, my, in my quest to grow up and become an, uh, an individual, uh, I went to UC San Diego here and, and ended up uh, having a year abroad in Madrid and then came back and realized, I wanna, I wanna keep experiencing that cultural thing and I went and did another uh, year at the University of Bologna my last year. Um, and then uh, UC San Diego mailed me my degree and I, and I worked there for another 12 years until I finally came back to the States because my grandmother was getting old and needed me. My grandfather had already passed away and my grandmother kind of needed me to be around. So um, she was there for me and, and I thought it was my obligation to be there for her. So I, I moved back to the States where I could be close to her um, in her last years and, and be a part of that. And, uh, and so here I am, and, and I've had the good fortune of, of working in environments where I can help people who maybe aren't as fortunate as my grandparents um, have a little bit uh, more golden luster in their golden years. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of me in a nutshell there, Ira. I, I, I thank you for that, and I, I appreciate that message. And you know these themes that you you mentioned uh, uh, of, of generosity, but also empathy, uh, sort of flow uh, throughout a lot of uh, of these different topics uh, that we're going to be getting into. Uh, not just the organization, but obviously the volunteers that volunteer for you, your funders, and 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 so forth. Um, Take us back a little bit, just to, if you would, sort of the history of the organization. I was reading a little bit online that sort of the original, the sort of the inception of Meals on Wheels originated uh, sort of sort of pre World War II at the beginning of, of the Blitz in, in, over over in the UK. Uh, talk about sort of just how the whole concept got started in terms of uh, this principle of hey, we we want to deliver these meals to people that that need the nutrition that need food and calories and, and, and so forth, uh, and, and a little bit of sort of how the organization has progressed over time from that initial concept. Yeah, it, it's, you know, you can imagine so much of the world has changed since the turn of the last century. And, you know, philanthropy has changed, volunteerism has evolved. And it was all, oftentimes there were the, the organizations that were really kind of centered around the churches where you had people who had time, um, you know, I mean, from a philanthropic standpoint, it was often the wives of these uh, wealthy people who were um, given the task of supporting the community um, because their husbands were busy working. Um, but they were also the people who kind of naturally doted and realized where the shortcomings um, in their communities were. And with regards to the aging population, of course, basic needs are always something that kind of jump out at you right away. So these people, I mean, from the very beginning in churches and these communities of, of women, you know, going around saying, you know, we, we need to make sure that these seniors um, are getting the nutrition they need in particular if they don't have somebody around them to care for them. I mean, you may be like me where I'm kind of the sandwich generation. You're taking care of the younger generation but you're also looking after the older generation. And so, you know, the people like us in this phase of our life where we can do so much and have more means potentially, we're the ones who really kind of stepped up and started developing these programs. And a lot of it was just, it wasn't so formal. It was just, uh, you know, boots on the ground, let's make food, cook for and deliver food to these people. And in San Diego, it had a very similar type of a beginning, right? And then as these structures grow over time in, in, in the decades, um, they become a bit more sophisticated. Uh, it requires a larger effort, you know, and I can tell you right now, if we're delivering meals every day here in San Diego to 2000 seniors, and that is a big logistic challenge that isn't necessarily handled, you know, in, in a church basement type of a thing, right? right? So these programs started to grow in kind of the administration of the program and the connections uh, with different programs and the, and the communities that provide services. And today what we have are, you know, Meals on Wheels around the country. They, they've actually, even though they've maintained this grassroots ethos of really delivering to individuals, um, we now have the opportunity to enhance that with technology. Yeah. Um, the important thing though about Meals on Wheels, I think across the country is that more than a meal aspect. Yeah. And that is what I think is, is what is, is most interesting and where we stand the most to gain. The, the nutrition is kind of, the entryway into the door. And pre-pandemic, we were actually able to cross the threshold and go in and, you know, if Mrs. Hernandez uh, needed you to put her food in the microwave and then set it to the table and she'd make her way to the table, you had that opportunity to do that. Now during the pandemic, 
We do it all from a safe distance in the health side, but we have luckily technology um, that showed up just in time for the pandemic and, and in the form of an app where all of our volunteers um, on their routes, you know, we're, we're going to 2000 doorsteps every day in San Diego, which is by the way, also a remarkable uh, resource for anybody who wants to provide kind of interesting levels of, of care. Um, and we show up and we interact with these seniors and okay, it's, it's a delivery app. So there's kind of the GPS aspect of here, you know, the meal has arrived at Mrs. Hernandez's home check and she's good. Now, then there's the whole wellness check piece, right? Right. And this is what gets really interesting. So health is really, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. Health is determined by a lot of different factors that aren't just food or your vitals. Um, really significant uh, kind of social determinants of health um, understanding are, are really kind of guiding a lot of our principles now of how we engage with these seniors. And so we know that seniors who are lonely actually have a lot more uh, physical ailments and issues, right? Because of isolation. Um, so when you have this app and you show up at the house and you deliver the meal to Mrs. Hernandez, but you also notice maybe the house is a little off or her appearance is off or she might seem confused or something. On this app, there are eight different things that you can indicate uh, about her condition in this wellness check. And that is immediately sent back to our care coordinators um, who then navigate a system of, of options, follow up with Mrs. Hernandez, potentially her family and anybody else, and can intervene to make sure that she gets what she needs because our early warning system tells us she may be slipping, right? So these early warning systems right now during the pandemic have been key. And, and at Meals on Wheels, we were, we were the first uh, in the country along with a, a, an organization in Ohio that has a very rural community. Um, to pilot this. And now all of our volunteers um, have been using it for over a year like it. And by the way, many of our volunteers are seniors themselves. So um, it's a great opportunity for them to also brag about the fact that they're using an app with their grandkids. So they sound like they're hip, right? Um, and, and they're actually able to intervene um, on the earlier side of things. And we're, uh, we are mobilizing people even during the pandemic to get there and, and provide these types of services that are gonna keep those seniors from slipping. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the evolution of these grassroots organization. But one thing I can tell you, Ira, is anything that I do from a technology standpoint is never going to substitute the people time, mm -hmm. that interaction face-to-face. -face. So we're all looking forward to herd immunity and, and being maskless again so we can kind of cross the threshold because that's where we do our best work. But nevertheless, even now, that engagement, that, that you know, two minutes to 10 minutes where we're hanging out and chatting with the seniors about their day and their needs and everything is oftentimes it's the only interaction that they're getting every day. Yeah. Um, and we will never have that go away. Um, we're never gonna be an Uber Eats that just drops the meal and runs. Um, it's, it's really spending time. So any, any technological um, advance that, that we bring about is only going to enhance that human reaction, interaction. It's never going to replace it. It's, it's, and that's key to, to what is going on today. And I know I watched one of your uh, past podcasts with one of our huge supporters, uh, Shelly Lyford mm -hmm. of West Health Institute and the Gary and Mary West Foundation. And they were really key. I'm um, also the Legacy Foundation here in San Diego as well, um, founded by a former football player, Rolf Benerska and his wife, Mary. Um, they were really key in understanding the need for this type of technology but also the, the, the need for maintaining really the ethos of the grassroots organization. So we worked with Shelly and their team to add on to what we already had is, you know, okay, we've got a tracking app. We're gonna start using that because it's gonna create efficiencies in our system of delivering meals. Since, you know, we're using that app already, they, it was actually a pretty simple overlay of technology, but the results uh, of having that app and having that wellness check documented are, are actually a lot, uh, not simple at all, um, because you can imagine for healthcare providers right now how interesting this data is and how much the, the potential savings um, for the entire country, high touch uh, interventions every single day um, with a senior. Um, and so this, you know, again, here we have generosity and empathy because, you know, as, as Shelley was attesting, Gary and Mary themselves, um, are really dedicated to helping the senior population. They uh, took care of their age, aging parents. 
um, Rolf and Mary Bernerska uh, of the Legacy Foundation, the same thing. These people uh, with a lot of empathy have really stepped forward um, to, to make sure that we had these tools. So then the pandemic rolls along and we're kind of almost, we're, we're ready for it, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Even though we're never ready for something like this, we don't like it, we want it to go away. But luckily, because of this work that we had already done, we've been able to really provide a lot of early warning um, interventions, but just maintain that contact, right? So these senior, seniors feel less lonely. Um, and, and, and that's been key. And so I actually showed up here in July. So the team at the beginning of the pandemic, a year ago, they had a 50% spike in demand and were able to meet that demand in one month. Um, so we went from about 1,300 clients every day to 2,000, which is a remarkable increase and a really burdensome load on everybody. But uh, we, you know, because we had things like the app and everything, we were able to kind of logistically manage this and step up. And then I show up in July and then lo and behold, in December, I get a call from um, the, the, the people uh, that Mackenzie Scott, uh, philanthropist billionaire in, in the US, who just gave away last year $6.2 billion to charities. Yeah. Her people had vetted us at Meals on Wheels, known that over the years, uh, we have continued to impact a high number of people who particularly during the pandemic are at risk of further isolation. And uh, they made uh, a, I mean, this is unexpected. This is kind of every CEO's dream, um, a $4 million unsolicited, unrestricted gift to Meals on Wheels San Diego, just to us, um, so we can continue to do what we do. So there we have kind of empathy and generosity that kind of come together. And, and right when we're doing our strategic planning as well. So how do I, how do I build a sustainable um, program, you know, sustainable growth, right? You can, you can burn through that money in a, in, a, in, a, in a short period of time. How do I make it count? So it really has an impact over decades. Um, and that's what we're doing right now during our strategic planning, thanks to their generosity. So um, it's, it's been a spectacular ride. And, uh, you know, the seniors we serve are super grateful uh, for everything that we've been able to do to keep on doing during the pandemic. Uh, and we're going to keep doing it too and do it better. That's my yeah. hope. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a fascinating set of programs. The, you know, you touched on several things here, um, extremely important uh, concepts, uh, social determinants, which it, it's becoming more and more respected as a, as a concept in terms of, you know, we're not just this body, we are where we grow up, we're where we live, we're where we work, we're where we age. Uh, and then this topic of aging in place. Uh, I, I do not want to be in an old age home. I, my mother till her last day wanted to be in her apartment. That's what she enjoyed. She wanted to be around family. Uh, and then, you know, you know, I was looking through, um, you know, some of the different uh, sort of, as you mentioned, sort of these early warning or sort of the referral components of the uh, technology, mm -hmm. a very important one on here that you, you've mentioned, and that's just sort of uh, the social engagement that I, I saw an article recently about just how many people are, are dying during COVID because of loneliness. Uh, I'm lonely during, and I can imagine, you know, uh, you know, the, the elderly. Talk, talk a little bit about just sort of that component of this when you have the volunteers going out there and how appreciative uh, the recipients are and sort of this communication that occurs, the personal uh, touch of, of this whole process. It, it, it is beautiful and meaningful. You know, we, we just featured in, in our little uh, annual report one of our great volunteers, um, Mary, and she and her husband go out and when they deliver meals, and she's a senior herself, she's well into her 70s, and she's been doing this volunteering with us for like 20 something years. But she and her husband put the bag, you know, that the meal is in, they put it on a silver platter. They honk the horn so the seniors kind of know they're coming and they literally have a big silver platter and she carries it up, um, just kind of, that's her shtick, just to kind of brighten the days of the seniors. And we have another senior and, and he, um, delivers meals for us. And he's part of a senior group who kind of performs standards and stuff. And he says a mini day that he has a client that's particularly lonely, he'll serenade them. He'll sing a song to them just right off the air. And they love it, right? I mean, sure. that would totally brighten my day. Um, Me too. <laughs> but yeah, right, exactly. So, but we luckily also right before the pandemic hit, we were developing this other um, program that our volunteers could get engaged in. And that would be, that's the companionship call program. So, you can volunteer by delivering meals or you can volunteer by once to three times a week 
having your designated senior that you're paired up with and calling them and having a conversation that's anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. just to brighten their day and interrupt the loneliness. And luckily we were kind of preparing all of that. So about a month into the pandemic, we were able to start rolling that out across the county. And it's been really important because only after about three or four months, most of our volunteers were already reporting that they were noticing a cognitive decline in, in our clients um, on a pretty significant number. And, and, you know, and, and it's something that I think concerns me most, it's gonna resonate through this pandemic, is really the, the long-term effects of you know, this cognitive decline because of lack of interaction. You know, kids, when they're developing the, 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 the child mind, uh, uh, developing my needs, these interactions to kind of create new pathways as it develops. Um, and seniors need this interaction and it's kind of to preserve these pathways, right, in their brain and, and, and to, to ensure that they're keeping these, these pathways active and firing on all cylinders. And so this program kind of showed up at the nick of time. So we have several hundred people that are enrolled in this program. Um, the volunteers like it because also there were some volunteers that during the pandemic were not able um, because they felt for their safety to go out and about in public, but they could still do something. And, um, and it's actually mutually beneficial. I have a good friend who's in her early 70s and she's a retired social worker and she wanted to sign up for this program. She's told me her name is Liz and she shared with me that um, she's more excited about uh, the calls um, a couple of times a week with her senior that she's paired with and the senior themselves, she's sure of it. But um, it's been a really helpful tool, but we need a lot more of these types of tools. Um, these seniors that we're dealing with are kind of a little bit, tend to be a little bit lower. You know, they're, they're not the middle class senior and, and you know, 90% of them aren't using computers or smartphones. So they don't have the opportunity to do these cool online classes and all of this. Yeah. So in, in, in lieu of that, you know, you're, you're using, what is the technology that they're already familiar with and using? And that's the telephone. And, and of course, for them, it's the TV and telephone. So, so this has been important. Um, but looking into the future now, if you can imagine the baby boomers, when they're, you know, 10 years down the road and they're needing our services, they're going to be really already using smartphones and they're going to be able to use these great online services. Like we partner with a great organization called Oasis um, that provides online, now online learning. It's a massive online learning platform. It became online during the pandemic. Um, and it's great because you join a class and you have a cohort of people. And it can be a class about religion, history, politics, uh, art history, gardening, anything. There are thousands of classes to choose from, but you've got your cohort. So you know John and, and Louisa and everybody in your class that you show up and you interact with. That is vital, I think, to combating loneliness if you're isolated. The seniors that we're serving predominantly right now don't have that level yet of sophistication with computers for the most part. A few of them do, but really not many. So um, we're relying on the phone and luckily we have this companionship calling program that we were able to roll out during the pandemic, so. Excellent. Um, is, uh, continuing along those lines, you know, you're mentioning sort of uh, the next generation and, and I, it got me thinking, um, Shelly introduced me to this other organization, Generations United, about sort of the, the importance, not just for the elderly to to interact with the, the new generation, but vice versa, what the younger folks can learn uh, from that generation. Uh, you know, I, my mother always liked to see me, but she really liked to see my kids. <laughs> they, they made her a lot happier uh, or whatever. But um, in terms of the volunteers, because you mentioned you know, some of the volunteers are themselves seniors. Uh, you have volunteers on the younger end that uh, are, are getting involved in this. And I'm just interested in sort of, um, you know, is there a preference <laughs> for who's stopping by? I, I can imagine. That. You know what? You're absolutely right. Um, I, on Veterans Day, I, I delivered meals to one of our clients and he was a World War II veteran. And his son who was there is also a Vietnam veteran, right? So I showed up and it was a Wednesday and he said, oh, it's great to have you, Brent. What an honor to have the CEO. And the press was there and everything. He goes, but usually on Wednesdays, I have two young ladies and they're pretty cute and they're out delivering my meal. So it's a really good day. I like Wednesday, right? Uh, um, and, then, and then people do take their kids and grandkids with them as well. So we do have younger parents, younger families delivering meals. We have organizations um, that we'll partner with, nonprofits as well, that work with young people and, and parents with the young people that teach kind of the value of, of you know, being civically minded and civically engaged. 
And so we do have those experiences for the seniors and th those you're spot on. Um, they like the youth, they, they, they like that energy, um, it, it brightens their day a lot. So that's something that we always want more of and, and focus on. And, and I think part of our strategic plan too, we're, we're looking at how to really bring more of that to the seniors. Um, we ourselves are one of the Meals on Wheels that currently we don't have a congregate dining site. There are a couple of congregate dining sites. Actually, um, the West, uh, that's Gary and Mary West, they have a pay center. So there are some um, uh, services where we will take meals to kind of small congregate sites, but we currently don't have congregate dining. But, you know, one day we could potentially have a campus and have our kind of meal center together with our administration and even have like a little test kitchen and the seniors that can and in our mobile, maybe they could show up and have a meal um, there, have their meal for free. Um, and then we, we could, uh, you know, kind of work with the public. I would like to be known in San Diego, for example, like maybe the best tamales or the best pizza or something, <laughs> and even have the hipsters show up and dine with the seniors because uh -huh. there, there's no reason why we need to create our own, um, you know, kind of, isolated groups. Ageism is a real thing still. Oh, yeah. So if we can combat that, make that connectivity happen and relevance. One of the things I was really interested when I was listening to, to Shelley's talk about her experience in Japan, I kind of had a, you know, a, a similar experience uh, in Italy in that I just noticed, you know, that the 12 and a half years that I lived in Bologna, Italy, and by the way, Bologna, um, one of the years that I was there, um, had the lowest birth rate of any city on the planet. So there are a lot of seniors in Bologna, mm. but seniors in Italy are still very much a part of the family. And, you know, they oftentimes, they will live at a home at the beach or in the mountains. And so when the family, the extended family, mom and kids has time and they do their vacation and they go skiing in the mountains or spend, you know, the summer at the seaside, they're with grandma and grandpa. Um, and so the seniors are, are rarely left alone. And there's, there's a relevance. They have a role and they're doing something. They're part of raising the family. And, you know, it was back at the end of World War II, um, Del Webb, uh, this, you know, architect of these beautiful retirement communities, um, thought, well, you know, we've got to get seniors out of the workforce and retired because all these people are coming back from war in World War II and they're, they're going to need a job. Right. So let's create these places where people go and kind of retire um, and, and golf. Right. Uh, so imagine, you know, after we've experienced this for decades now. Right. And the existential crisis that goes along with floating in a state of suspended animation over a golf course and not having any more social relevance. Um, it, it's kind of a crappy model and it doesn't really work. Um, and so it's, I had to, I got to experience a culture where it's kind of not that way. Um, and then I lived in that culture as well. You know, my grandparents, like I said, all roads led to them, right? So they were a center. And if we can continue to focus on our efforts to keep seniors relevant, and part of that I think is really tying them into the younger generations and having a role in society, being part of the village that raises the kid, being, um, you know, or, you know, the wisdom that we need in our community as we are uh, creating. Um... And what they bring to the table, right? Um, yeah. I think that, that it's, it's imperative. Absolutely. What, um, I, I did a, uh, a show a couple days ago with a, uh, a tech company that was uh, creating some very interesting virtual reality tools for uh, seniors in, in uh, aged care homes, uh, allowing them to travel places that they had not or uh, revisit sort of experiences with other, with friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Just continuing along the, uh, the technology uh, front here, because I know, you know, you created the app, uh, extremely useful. Any uh, sort of obviously nothing confidential, but anything that you could talk about in terms of other interesting tools, technologies, as we get into this theme of, of supporting this, these, uh, these processes of aging in place, of the social determinants that you're looking at, the new programs that are coming down the line uh, involving some of these new technologies? You know, I, I think that's a really important question, Ira. There, there is such a need right now. Like I said, probably 95%, 90% of our clients don't even have internet, right? Yeah. So I think kind of focusing on the, the infrastructure that's needed for seniors and low-income low seniors and everything, 
um, as a priority, I think is going to be really important as we move forward. Um, maybe seniors shouldn't even have to worry about it, think about it, or pay for it. It's just there, it's given, right? That they have internet, that they have connectivity. Um, and seniors that aren't particularly uh, used to using their, their cell phones or smart devices, um, you know, they can all walk up to a screen and if there are four or five bubbles to choose from, touch them and start interacting in an easy, immediate way, they can do that, right? Um, so I think, personally, I think that it's, it's gonna take all of us working together to really make that a priority for society as an expense, because in the end, it's going to save us a lot as well. So, you know, we continue to trip, trip over a pound to pick up a penny. Um, you know, we need to do some investments on the front end. And, and so when you get these great partners, um, you know, like West and folks that, that understand this, I think that that is key. One of the things that I am interested in is really kind of the, the, the Bluetooth enabled devices that people could wear on their person um, that could easily interact with, you know, potentially something in their house that transmits to our care coordinator or every day when, when that volunteer comes up with their phone in their app. Um, and it downloads onto the phone. And then from there, that's the bridge back to our care coordination center. And you would have the 24 hour trended data of their blood sugar level, potentially if there's a Bluetooth enabled kind of blood sugar monitor or a, a blood pressure um, devices. So there are lots of these types of things um, and, and people are exploring them. So it's not part of what we're doing yet at Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. It's in our strategic plan and it's something that we want to look at and kind of go about it the right way. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of next level um, and it's the no brain because all that technology is out there. None of that is, you know, anymore. It, it, it's not, uh, you know, back to the future kind of science. Sure. It's, it's sure. here today stuff. Um, so it's kind of the organization and the structure behind it. So we start using that. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, there, there are great organizations like, you know, people I know, I, I, I had a great meeting once when I was raising funds for the Harnessing Plants Initiative. We got to meet and hear the um, founder and CEO of Nest speak okay. about philanthropy, you know, and, and Nest, you know, they've got these things that it, it's basically, it's, it's a thermostat in your house. It's a smart thermostat. Mm -hmm. Um, it knows when people are around and it knows when people are in the house. It knows when there's movement as well. Um, and so Nest, they actually, I think, donated to East LA like 10,000 of those devices at one point um, uh, for the communities who were having trouble affording energy, you know, because of the incredible heat spikes and everything we have. There are communities that are in, in peril um, due to this, but Nest was able to really lower their energy costs by putting a smart device in there that would keep the house at the right temperature only when needed, saving drastic. And they donated, it was like 10,000 of these devices, right? So to me, that is a, a business leader who is mindful of what really it takes and what needs to be done mm. um, in order to make a difference and take things to the next level. So I'm interested in folks like that stepping up in the senior space, you know, yeah. um, uh, specifically because only about 2% of foundations out there um, are specifically, specifically targeting senior needs. Um, so I want more of these smart uh, blue sky um, leaders and thinkers to step up with regards to what seniors need in order to make their situation better and more comfortable. Uh, technology is key to that. But back to my point uh, that I made at the very beginning, any technology that we bring to the table is never going to be a substitute for that face-to-face -face time when the volunteer shows up and delivers that meal. So yeah. that's kind of the grassroots of who we are, and we're definitely going to preserve that. Outstanding. Um, Frank, coming back to that theme that you just touched on, because I, I see it sort of <laughs> everywhere, sort of being in sort of the age, tech, longevity, uh, tech space. Obviously, you, you have the relationship with, with Gary and Mary West organization, wonderful people, um, and Shelly as well. And you know, I, I love these stories. You know, someone that spends decades creating a business, creating jobs, but, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't buy a private island or a 500 foot yacht, but invests, no. uh, puts it back in, you know, what's really important uh, in some of these themes. Um, just obviously, once again, nothing confidential, but when somebody like Mackenzie Scott calls you up or right <laughs> call you up, uh, what was that like? Did you, did at first you just hang up the phone? You thought it was a joke or, uh, because, you know, I, this is that, 
thing as you're saying it's, it's sort of the, the ceo's dream that you would get a phone call like that and if there's only as you were saying only a couple percent of these foundations are putting any money into aging um what what got uh mckenzie scott interested in this and are there learnings from that that we can say hey you know for the next <laughs> a few a couple hundred billionaires over here that aren't doing anything how can we stimulate that process it's such an interesting discussion right now. And there's so many kind of social factors and, and, and things in the history that come into play here. But we have this, maybe it's, it's not the, the right uh, economy, um, global economy right now. Um, there are individuals that have more money than entire countries. Yep. Um, it, you know, kind of doesn't work. And, and they're realizing too that their money is growing faster than they can spend it. So, mm -hmm. so in order for Mackenzie Scott sixty billion dollars, I want to get rid of six billion dollars in one year. Um, it's not easy, right? How do you do that quickly in a pandemic when you know there are organizations that have to step up and meet the need now? Yeah. So what you do is you hire people that go around and vet and look at already the tried and true in the established, right? And that's kind of a quick go-to. What are the organizations, who are the populations most at risk, right? And they could be minorities and seniors and, you know, all the, and, and they targeted those, you know, really quickly. And then who are the organizations that already are making an impact in that area and can step it up and has an infrastructure it can move quickly? Um, but again, to, I got four million, but there are a lot of four millions. It takes a lot of four millions to add up yeah. <laughs> to 6.2 billion, like right? So, just, um, so it, it's a massive undertaking. What's beautiful though about this, and I think this is kind of what I think a lot of billionaires can learn from uh, McKinsey. Um, you know, and uh, you know, she's an author. She's a very thoughtful, introspective, empathetic person uh, to begin with. But when you make a donation to somebody like that in a quick manner, and it's a significant amount, and you say no strings attached, what she wants from me is an impact report once a year for three years. That's it. And it's a three-page document, right? Um, she and, and, and they say this is a one-time only. So that what that means, if she's telling me it's a one-time only, it's, Brent, you and your organization, you don't owe me anything. I'm giving this to you already. So you don't have to try to court me. Um, so she's kind of released herself from the power of influence over me at this point. So this is not to improve her position of power and influence over me or others at all. It's simply to give others the tools to do what they're already doing and step away. Um, that's the bless and release approach that is pretty spectacular and pretty rare. So. Um, and I understand that there are a lot of really wise philanthropists out there like the West that know that, you know, they want to help people have more impact. Mm -hmm. So they're more involved, but there are also those other ones that want to be involved because their name recognition and all of that. So, you know, the empathy and the generosity um, were kind of like times 10 when somebody said, here it is and do your thing and you don't owe me anything. Um, it, you know, I know that's not going to happen again. And if it does, I'm going to call you and I'm going to tell you all about it because, yeah. And, but it's kind of the condition right now of our world of a, a small number of people having way too much money. Yeah. Um, and it's growing faster than they can give it away. Um, it, it, you know, um, and, and luckily there's some spectacular human beings out there um, and they realize that, you know, an island and, you know, building an empire. I just, I, I remember all those James Bond movies. And then, you know, I got to a point when I was in my late, you know, like teenager years, I was like, now, if you owned an island and you built that thing inside a volcano, wouldn't that cost like millions and millions of dollars? <laughs> right. So I still think that way. I still go back to that image of like, you know, the villain living inside a yeah. volcano in this beautiful, sleek mid-century modern. Um, and there are people that probably want to create that for themselves or, you know, go uh, for a trip around the moon, so to speak, or build a city on Mars yeah. um, and name it after themselves. Um, but there's still a lot of people out there that just want to help people here today now um, do the right thing and, and solve some really critical pressing issues. Uh, so hats off, man. Um, uh, McKinsey, the West, they're just, they're teaching the rest a, le a lesson, I think. And, and, and that's the beauty of it being announced as well. And, and one of the reasons why I'm not quiet when I get a gift, I tell the world about that gift. Yep. 
and, and when you're a small nonprofit, and you, you probably get this, you can imagine that, you know, we're, we at Meals on Wheels, it's not a luxurious organization, um, and we're not in fancy offices, and we are used to doing things on such a shoestring budget. Mm. So you get a gift like this, right? And you think, oh, Well, no, what's been great is the community understands I finally have the chance to build and to, you know, have infrastructural change yep. that can support more because I'm giving meals to 2,000 people in San Diego that are 60 and above every day. And there are 700,000 in San Diego that are 60 and above in San Diego County. So I have no doubt that I could put my foot on the gas pedal and double, triple, quadruple uh, that number pretty easily but it takes infrastructure to do that, right? So I now have the chance to build that infrastructure and the community, the generosity of the individuals has continued. They're still making their 25, 50, $100, $1,000 a year gifts. So the meal, they are underwriting the meals. So that is taking care of the, the daily, my kind of, you know, my operating budget is managed and now I can grow for the first time. That's spectacular and it's kind of a dream come true for a new CEO. I mean, I walked into this July, it used to be just a fundraiser. So um, <laughs> I kind of scored with organization and with you know the generosity that's been demonstrated to us too. And then like all of that blood, sweat and tears at the beginning of the pandemic where everybody had to you know freak out to meet that 50% increase in demand that we had, um, that was done and I walked in and so I'm like, you guys don't need me. I'm just like, what am I here for, right? <laughs> They did all the hard work. I have got an amazing team of colleagues that uh, really took it to the next level. And so this is fun now. They realize that we get to do it better um, and smarter. Um, so, um, you know, thanks to Mackenzie Scott. And then also there's a, a local family in San Diego, the McKinney family, that a couple of years ago gave us four and a half million um, right before the pandemic. So we've got significant funds right now to invest in infrastructure and strategic planning is key to that and, and, and the help of smart individuals too, because I do go to people like Shelly and the West uh, Health Institute to find out this, help me figure out the smarter ways to do things because they're engaging a lot of people that are really measuring impacts of the types of things that they're doing. Um, there's data out there. And so, and I'm relying heavily on data um, and, and, and people like them have kind of hold the key to that and are doing a lot of really important work. Um, so. This is, is, is not just a fun process. It's, it's kind of tough, it's, it's scientific, it's data-driven, um, but it's, it's imperative that we get this right now that we have the resources to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. And, help a lot of, and I hope a lot of people can learn from um, Mackenzie Scott's and the West's uh, initiatives. Sir, for sure. their, totally, their, amen. Their, uh, their empathy, their generosity, I, I think that we need a lot more of that uh, from these folks. And, but, but my grandmother, you know, I, I was, it was funny when I was raising money at the Salk Institute, you know, and I was talking about a crowdfunding campaign, this donor, she was really sweet. She reminded me, she goes, Brent, crowdfunding. She goes, the March of Dimes, you go around door to door. She goes, that's crowdfunding old school, right? That's yeah. the analog version. <laughs> and I used to go around with my grandmother every year for the March of Dimes. And, you know, we'd get, you know, a few dollars here and there knocking on the door. There was just a, a few blocks that she would hit up every year and send in, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever. But that was the old school crowdfunding. So generosity still exists in the community on that level too, which is yeah. fabulous. So you've got it on all levels. So that's, that's, you know, I, I want to remind people too, and, and as, as a, you know, when I would oversee any kind of fundraising shop, it's, it's the spirit of generosity it doesn't just exist for our donors. Um, if, if a donor walks into my fundraising department and people are sitting there with their arms folded across their chest and their eyebrows raising, how much money are you going to give us? And making this person feel like an ATM, um, you're not really right. <laughs> exuding the generosity that you're expecting from these donors either. So, the nonprofits themselves that are getting this money do so and need to do so with also the spirit of generosity and gratitude towards these donors. Um, um, we're, we're all in this together and it takes a village. Um, so we need to appreciate not only the work that we're doing, this grassroots stuff, but uh, the hard earned funds of these donors that step up and, and make a difference. So, Absolutely. Brent, I have to ask, um, we're, we're deviating here for a minute, but um, somewhere over here on my bookshelf, I have a copy of the Prague Cemetery. Uh, say a few words about working with Umberto Eco, if you would. 
Well, I didn't get to work with him. I just got to sit in his class and I got to take an exam with him. And I was pretty excited because, um, uh, you know, I, I had read and then I saw the movie, The Name of the Rose, and I was trying to read uh, Foucault's Pendulum. Mm -hmm. um, and I get a chance to do a class with this guy and he's legendary. He's so much fun. So the University of Bologna. So the context is I'm in this giant room with an fresco ceiling. The university was founded in 1088. So these buildings are kind of peppered throughout the city and they're often in these like 18th, 17th, 16th century gorgeous buildings. And he comes in there with this big hat and this red scarf, you know, <laughs> very flamboyant. And he has everybody in stitches. And so I'm kind of terrified because he is, he starts making all of these very specific cultural and political references in Italian. And I had just arrived in Italy and I was just learning Italian. So everybody is laughing, busting a gut and I'm, I'm missing like 80% of the humor, right? So I was on, um, I, I was really, you know, I, my learning curve really spiked. And so by the time I got through the end of the course, I just realized um, his brilliance and, you know, semiotics is his field. He invented it. It's, you know, and, and so I, I got to do a paper on coming from the anthropology standpoint, um, culture, uh, culture, what is culture from a, a semiotic standpoint, right? A system of internalized symbols. Um, and it was really, it was, it was fun. It was a beautiful intellectual pursuit. And, you know, and I got to do it in this remarkable um, context in Italy and, and I was successful. And so in the exam, you know, you know, he, or exams in Italy are oral. So, I had a paper that I did and one of his uh, assistants kind of graded it and worked on uh, with me on that paper. But then the final exam is this oral exam and it's an interrogation for about 45 minutes and they'll ask you anything and how it relates basically to the price of meat in China or to the pre-Socratic philosophers and you know what would uh, Pythagoras have thought of this. I mean, it's like, right, they really teach you how to think, right? And so you're getting raked over the coals by Umberto Eco and I did pretty good, but a few things I was like, ooh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> And he's like, well, you know, a 30 is a maximum grade, Brent, and I can't give you a 30, right? But I can give you a 29. I'm pretty impressed. So, um, yeah, I'm like, oh, darn, a 29 out of 30. So uh, I was flying high. Uh, I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> it, it was great. And he was a, a great person. Um, I, I did four exams at the University of Bologna, so uh, semiotics being one of them. And, you know, all of these exams that I was doing, these four exams, I was reading thousands of pages in Italian on, you know, social psychology, on cultural anthropology, on anthropology developing countries, semiotics. Um, so I totally drank from the fire hose. But at the end of that, too, um, I was often called uh, to kind of be the uh, interpreter or translator. And I had friends who worked in City Hall. So like if the BBC was there to do a press conference, they would hand me the microphone and I would be the interpreter between the BBC press folks and all the Italian press folks in the audience asking questions. And my friend would like leave the room and leave me there to manage all of this and manage the language and stuff. So I got, um, I got to be good at the whole translation thing and loved it. And luckily it's part of who I am still. I'm, I, I still think in Italian, I, you know, I moved there when I was 24 and I lived there, or, or excuse me, 21 when I moved to Italy and I lived there until I was 34. So there were really significant li uh, um, times in my life and I got to do translating, interpreting, and then a representative for a publishing company and international medical conferences. And, and um, it, was, it was fun. And if I had to hit rewind play, I think I'd do the whole darn thing over again, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. And I got to learn how to cook and appreciate what oh, yeah. you do, right? It's kind of next level, right? When you live in a country. And so everybody loves Italian food. And so they're, what's your favorite Italian restaurant in San Diego, Brent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but there are, some, there are some pretty good ones, right? So there, there are Italians here that have restaurants, but you know, it's, it's rough. I mean, Bologna is also the food capital of Italy. So that says a lot there. Um, and it's, they call it the fat city, fat because it's wealthy, but, uh, and, and learned. Um, because it's the oldest university, um, but fat because of the food. <laughs> you like Italian food, Ira? Oh, I love Italian food. I actually had a friend that I, that also, he, he was at the University of Chicago, and he spent, uh, I don't know if it was a semester or a year at University of Bologna, but uh, he, he came back with stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, oh, yeah, I, I eat everything. Um, but yes, definitely a big fan of Italian food. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and in, in Bologna, the traditional cuisine, they, they weren't much into olive oil, and this was, you know, back then. Now, they have a more balanced diet, um, but it was more the base of lard and cream and butter, yeah. 
right? So, um, and it's really cold and damp there in the wintertime. So you really appreciate the lard, the cream and the butter <laughs> in the wintertime and all those lovely cheesy dishes and ragu and all that stuff. So um, yeah, it's, it's a great place. I, I have dear friends there still. Um, I speak to someone in Bologna probably once a week. Um, go back there. I celebrated my 50th birthday over in Italy and had friends, you know, join me for that, that as well. So um, it's, it's still uh, very much a part of my life. And my dream is to one day um, have a little retirement apartment in Bologna and I could go back there a few months a year. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's a dream. <laughs> very cool. We'll follow you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Come on over. I'll throw a party and invite you. <laughs> Oh, uh, Brett, it's um, coming back to you now. I, obviously, uh, you, you've had a fascinating career. You, you've met so many people, um, a, a lot of very important people in your life, from your grandparents, uh, the West, you know, Mr. Mackenzie Scott, Umberto Echo. Um, take some time. Any, anybody else in terms of mentors, influencers, other family members that you might want to mention, shout out to that have been really uh important in making Brent Wakefield who you are today and if it wasn't for them you'd be off doing publishing or law or, or something totally different right uh you know for me I mean from a personal level my dad's sister my aunt Judy so she uh when I was 10 she moved back to the Ozarks so she's in Oklahoma right on the Arkansas border she lived out in the middle of nowhere on a 40 acre piece of property um, and about uh, 300 yards uh, on the edge of her property into this thick woods where you could barely walk was the kind of abandoned dilapidated cabin of Pretty Boy Floyd who was a famous outlaw who sure. you know escaped across the border into the you know the the Cherokee nation or what are the Indian nation at the time um, right so really interesting part of the world um, and my aunt though she was this lovely person who uh, I go spend my summers with and ride horses. So she um, had horses, a lot of animals, trained horses, and she was kind of a horse whisperer. Um, and I just liked hanging out with her and talking with her. And she was, she was kind of my friend, a buddy, an adult who, who uh, I felt was proud of me, right? So to have somebody that I had so much respect for and love for, and, and you know, I, I was just a little kid and, and needed that. Um, and she was so proud of me and she would brag about me all the time and bring me into conversations with her adult friends and stuff. And, and you know, and I would hang out with these great people in the Ozarks, very different world, right? Um, uh, and ride horses and have all of these great kind of summer experiences, so enriching. Um, the outdoors and kind of that contact with nature and horses and all of that. And that's kind of, I guess, another thing I share with, with Shelly, right? She was talking about kind of the bucolic um, upbringing she had. I had it just in fits and spurts um, in the summertime in, in, in the Ozarks there, but um, it was really important. And, and I think the, the lessons that I learned from my aunt were really about what matters. Um, she had a very, very modest life because all the money that she earned from making Western clothing and saddles and shaps and, and training people's horses and stuff, went to feed the horses uh, and all of our animals, right, in this, in this farm. So it was a modest house, in it, but it was the most beautiful place to be. Um, wouldn't, want any, uh, wouldn't want any other experience. And she was just this, this great uh, soul and very well-educated, well-read. Um, and, and, so she, and she contributed to a newsletter in Fort Smith, Arkansas. It was kind of for horsey people. And, and occasionally I got to, as a teenager, write a little article and, and be in that newsletter, which was a lot of fun too. So um, that was just a, a, an important part of my life. And, and then I, and, and I also had um, some, some great friends in, in Italy, I think, that just really inspired me by, by who they are. And one of my best friends now, she um, has her own kind of little fashion company, but she's busy right now. She's got two parents, a father with severe dementia and a mom who's kind of losing it. And in the pandemic, she's right now their sole caregiver. So she kind of had to abandon this, you know, work of hers. Um, and, you know, she's spending like eight or nine hours a day and it's super challenging. I mean, my heart goes out to her, but just so much respect because she's not gonna let anybody else do yeah. what only she can do for her parents. Um, so gosh, right? So these, these are the people we need out there. They're all good stories. These are like small heroes in the world, but they, they mean so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Incredibly important message there. Coming back to generosity, the empathy again. It's, uh, 
Yeah, yeah really a cornerstone. Uh, we need more of this in the world today. So um, that's right, Brent. It's um, it's it was it's really wonderful listening to your story, uh, everything you're doing. Um, and really just wishing you, especially in today's environment, and wishing you the best with all of this moving forward. Um, the, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode uh, on our podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Brent Wakefield, President and Chief Executive Officer of Meals on Wheels, located in San Diego County, uh, providing calories, nutrition, health monitoring, social interaction to, to uh, thousands of homebound seniors, uh, spreading this message of generosity and empathy. Uh, Brent, it's, it was really a, a great time listening to your story. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come do this. Uh, I want to thank you for everything you do. And as we say uh, on the show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for all these seniors. Uh, and it's uh, just really, really marvelous stuff. And, and, and just thank you uh, for, for everything. Well, thank you, Ira. Thank you for, for giving us all a platform to, to talk about these things and share our stories and, and all that. It's been a great opportunity and, and fun to chat with you. Um, yeah, thanks. And I'm a talker. So I guess it was fun to talk at you. Um, but talk with you too. <laughs> I, I like when people talk. <laughs> That's the only way you make the connections and, and, and learn. So th thanks so much, Brett. It was a great time. All right. Well, thank you and, and, and have a good one. I appreciate it. Take care, Ira.